glad that you could come be with us. We're in a series, if you'll go to John chapter 12. We've been in the Gospel of John in a series, Portraits of Christ in John's Gallery. John's Gallery being the Gospel of John. Have you been enjoying this series? Three of you have, that's great. Uh, I mean, how can you go wrong? We're exalting Jesus every Sunday, right? We're learning more and more about Jesus. Each chapter gives us a different portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 12, we're going to see him as the king of Israel. The king of Israel. You know, for thousands of years, the Jewish people looked for their Messiah to come. They were looking for a great military leader, weren't they? A conquering king who would come and defeat their enemies, restore Israel to their uh, former greatness and glory, bring in the millennial kingdom. That's what they were looking for. They didn't expect their king to come as a poor carpenter, right? Possessing no weapons, no army, no power, as far as political power. And they never thought he'd be crucified. They weren't expecting that. They were looking for the Lion of Judah. But he came as the Lamb of God. And they weren't ready for the Lamb. We've already noticed back in John 1.11, he came unto his own, and his own, his own people received him not. I mean, of all the people in the world, it should have been the Israelites that would have recognized the Messiah. I mean, think of all the prophecies he fulfilled. And yet, most of them did not receive him. They rejected him. Even though he revealed himself to them in many ways through signs and wonders and fulfilled prophecy, yet they rejected him. In spite of his feat of power, like raising Lazarus from the dead, in spite of his fulfilling prophecy, in chapter 12 we're going to see another prophecy that was fulfilled by the Lord Jesus. He comes into Jerusalem, and just in a few days, he's arrested, tried, and crucified. He comes in on Palm Sunday, and one week he will be crucified. And on the next Sunday, he'll raise from the dead. So let's look at this. In John chapter 12, Let's begin reading with verse number 12. If you want to stand with me to honor God's word, if you're physically able, give you one last chance to stress before you take a nap. Look at verse 12. It says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the king of Israel. There's our text right there. Blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord Jehovah. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written. Verse 15 is a quote from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's coat. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things were written of him. They had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. And the Pharisees, therefore, said it among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Don't you wish that were true? I wish the world would go after Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Let's talk about Jesus, the King of Israel today. And I hope that you have welcomed him into your life as your Lord and King. And if you've not done that, I hope you'll do that today. I hope this will be your day of salvation and you welcome the King of Kings into your heart, into your life. Now, you get, you get through a lot, lot of writing today, don't you? Look at that outline. 
So uh, that'll help keep, keep you awake. If you want to take notes, the first thing I want you to see is the presentation of the king. Let's look at the presentation of the king. And note the method of his presentation. It was prophesied by Zechariah that Messiah would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Now think about this. Here comes Jesus riding on a donkey. And the Romans probably have been made aware that this man claims to be the king of Israel. They're probably on high alert, waiting his coming. And here he comes riding a donkey. Don't you imagine the Romans kind of snickered? So you're kidding me. This is the king riding in on a lowly donkey. They probably thought that was funny. Kings don't ride donkeys, do they? That came from a white charger. By the way, he's coming back that way. He may have went in on a donkey then, but he's coming back on a white charger. And guess what? We all get to ride a white horse with him. So you might be practicing your riding skills and get ready for that. But he's coming in, and his own disciples really didn't see the import of what they were witnessing until later on. They realized what had happened. They saw the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And folks, he fulfilled hundreds of prophecies. I mean, how can anybody deny that this is the word of God? Just look at the prophecies that Jesus himself fulfilled that were promised concerning the Messiah. So secondly, look, look at the moment of his presentation. He came in on what we call Palm Sunday. They were laying the palm branches down before him to welcome their king into Jerusalem. And his entrance coincides with another prophecy, a prophecy by Daniel. If you look over in Daniel chapter 9, and uh, note verses 24 through 27, and this is the prophecy Daniel made that, got, that Christ fulfilled on Palm Sunday. Look at this with me. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, talking about Daniel's people, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All this referring to Christ and his coming. Then he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now folks, that happened in the days of Nehemiah. When King Artaxerxes gave the commandment for Nehemiah to go back and rebuild Jerusalem in the walls that the Babylonians had destroyed, that's the beginning of this countdown that Daniel is sharing. The commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Sixty-nine weeks of years. The streets shall be built again and a wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks, weeks of years, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now, that means he'll be killed. To be cut off means that he will be killed, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The prince that shall come is referring to the Antichrist. His people are the Romans. He's going to come back and be over a revived Roman Empire. And the end thereof shall be with the flood to the end the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Again, talking about the Antichrist. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. We could be here all day just looking at that passage. That is a tremendous, I think that's one of the most tremendous prophecies that you'll find in the Bible. Daniel says, here is God's calendar. Here's God's plan laid out. 
a 70 week period, 70 weeks of years, 490 years is determined here. It begins with the order to rebuild the walls by Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah chapter 2 gives us the date when that happened. It was on March 14th, 445 B.C. that that order was given. It took 49 years to rebuild the walls. Then another 434 years until Messiah would come. Now folks, listen. Daniel gave the exact day that Messiah would enter into Jerusalem to be cut off. This is an amazing prophecy. If you use a Jewish lunar calendar, which equals 173,880 days, from March 14th, 445 B.C., you count those days, you come to April 6, 32 A.D., the very day Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Wow! How, how can you... Ignore that. Matter of fact, Matt and I shared this with a young man this week. A young man named Austin. You ought to pray for Austin's salvation. But he, he had trouble believing the Bible's word of God. And I knew what I was going to preach. And I, I said, let me share a prophecy with you. And we shared that with him. And, and I think we turned some light bulbs on in that young man. But folks, listen. There's no reason for you to ever doubt the Bible. Jesus fulfilled hundreds of prophecies just like this. Talks about Jerusalem being destroyed. That was fulfilled in 70 A.D. by Titus and the Roman legions. In the last days, Israel would be regathered in her land. We've seen that happen. Amen. There will be a great war that will engulf Israel. That's yet to happen. Ezekiel 38 tells us about the Gog of the battle of Gog and Magog. Russia and her allies will attack Israel, I think, sometime soon. I think it probably might be linked with the rapture. And folks, the stage is set. The stage is set for all this to happen. The times of the Gentiles is soon to come to an end. Now, God inserted the church age between the 69th and 70th week. 69 weeks of years have been fulfilled. One week of years is yet to be fulfilled. We call that the Great Tribulation period. Seven-year period of tribulation. That's yet to be fulfilled. But I believe we've come to the end of the times of the Gentiles. We've come to the end of the church age. And that's about to happen. We go on, note the, going back to our text, we note the multitudes at his presentation. Here's a great, great crowd of people welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem. They cried out, Hosanna, which means save now. In the light of his miracles, raising Lazarus from the dead, the people thought that Jesus would be the one who has the power to overthrow Rome and restore Israel to her glory. As I said, they were looking for a conquering king and in just three days some of these people that said crown him crown him in three days some of them are saying crucify him crucify him instead of hell him it's nail him right well people can be fickle can't they but what happened they realize that this Jesus of Nazareth, he's not the conquering lion of Judah. He stands before Pilate like a whip dog, like a lamb. They didn't like it. That's not what they were looking for. They didn't want a lamb. They wanted that lion. Where's he? Well, he's coming. You better be ready to receive him when he comes. They turned on him and cried for his blood. Again, a fulfillment of prophecy. 
Second, note the purpose of the king. Why did Jesus come? First, he came to die for mankind's sin. We see that in our text. Look at verse John 12, 24. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it. He that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life everlasting. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, serve me, him will the Father honor. So he came to die for mankind. His entire life was centered around the fact that he would have to die on a cross. And if he did not die on a cross, we would have no salvation. He must be the Lamb of God offering himself as a sacrifice. His entire life, he knew it was all going to end on a cross. Can you imagine that? He came to die as a lamb, to be rejected, to be beaten, to be nailed to a cross. And he did that all voluntarily for me and you. Amen. He didn't have to do that for us. Thank God he did. He came to die. He came secondly to draw men into himself. Drop down to verse 32. He says that. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Being lifted up on a cross was necessary. But because he was, we can be saved. The cross becomes a thing of great power and amazement. To think that the Son of God would endure that kind of death for a wretch like me. Amen. You agree I'm a wretch, don't you? How about you? You too? Jesus came to die for us. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish but that all come to repentance. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Number three, to duplicate his mission in saints. Jesus would open the way for all of us to be saved. He used a, a picture familiar to us. We understand about planting seed and getting a crop. As those grains of seed are placed into the ground, they die. And they provide a plant. And this new plant possesses the potential to bear thousands of new grains. Jesus died. He was risen from the dead. And he has the power to duplicate that in each and every one of us. Think about that. Hey, that's why Paul could say in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Is that true in your life? Not only does Jesus save us from our sins, he gives us a brand new life. A life that would be impossible without Christ. That's the essence of being born again. We're given a new life, aren't we? Jesus takes us as we are, saves us by grace, and changes us by his great power. He begins to live in us and through us through the Holy Spirit. He had a living illustration of that in Lazarus. I mean, just raised from the dead. Here's Lazarus sitting at the table with Jesus, and here's Lazarus living an impossible life. He's living an impossible life. But folks, if you're a child of God, so are you. Amen. When we allow Jesus to live through us, we're going to live that abundant life. What he said in John 10, 10, I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more. 
abundantly. Hey, are you enjoying the abundant life? You should. Third thing I want you to see is the prejudice against the king. They rejected him. They rejected his message. When they heard Jesus speak of being lifted up, did they know he was talking about a crucifixion? Being lifted up? Did they, did they have trouble grasping how a Messiah would have to die? That he would have to taste death first for everyone? They rejected the message of the cross, just like many do today. You know, have you ever talked to anybody about the Lord? Have you ever met people who just reject the message of the cross? They don't like it. They don't like what it means. They don't think they need a Savior. Like Ted Turner said, I don't need anybody dying for me. Well, he's wrong. We all do. We need a Savior. But many reject the message of the cross. They think they're too good to go to hell. They can make it to heaven on their own. But the Bible says, Hebrews 10, 26, For if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Folks, you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, there's nothing else. There's no, there's no plan B. There's no other way. There's one way, and Jesus is that way. They rejected his message. They rejected his ministry. He said in verse 34, who is this son of man? They were rejecting his ministry. In effect, they were saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Now, if you're lost, that's what you're saying. Say, wait a minute, preacher. No, you wait a minute. If he rejected Jesus Christ, you have said in your heart, I will not have this man reign over me. You got that right. But you'll regret it one day. I'm glad he reigns over me. He is my king. I have crowned him the king of my life. And I hope you have too. He's not just the king of Israel. He's the king of every born again believer. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You can reject Jesus, but my friend, you're also rejecting heaven. You're rejecting salvation. You're rejecting hope. You're rejecting eternal life. Because all of that comes by embracing the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, they rejected his miracles. As I said, he proved himself over and over again through signs and wonders that he performed. People still today, they, they reject the message of the cross. They reject his ministry. They reject his miracles. Write this verse down. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But... Unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Amen. It's not foolishness to us. We see the beauty of it. That the lamb had to come and sacrifice himself to pay our sin debt. And look at all the evidence of changed lives. Look at the people. You know, people always want to point out the hypocrites. Don't they? Why don't they point out people who love the Lord and live for the Lord and live a righteous life? Why don't they point them out? Why don't they look at the ones whose lives have been transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ? What about them? How do you explain them? He said, if I be lifted up, just like that brazen serpent was lifted up in the camp of Israel. You read about it in Numbers 21. They were saved by simply looking to that pole. Look and live. 
You know salvation is that simple? Look to Jesus and live. Put your faith and trust in him. Then the last thought I want to leave with you is the promise of the king. You see the promise of revelation. Look at verses 44 and 45 in John 12. Jesus said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. He promises, those that receive him shall see God. See, Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. He said, I and the Father are one. He came to reveal the Father to us. And many, many say they're looking for God, but they're looking in all the wrong places. God has revealed himself to us. And he's found in the person of Jesus Christ. The promise of revelation, the promise of release. Look at verse 46. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me shall not abide in darkness. We've already talked about Jesus, the light of the world, haven't we? He comes in darkness, must flee. We're saved by the grace of God. We're given a new life, and with that comes a new light, and we're set free from the bondage of sin. Amen. Jesus said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Nothing in this world can set you free. Only Jesus can do that. And then thirdly, there's a promise of rescue. He promises all those who receive him that he will deliver them from the wrath and condemnation of God to come. When you receive Jesus by faith, Folks, you're delivered from the penalty of your sins. You're justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Isn't that wonderful? No. I stand before God justified because I stand clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He took my sin and gave me his righteousness. Romans 5, 9 says much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That ought to make you want to shout. Amen. Amen. We've been justified, saved from the wrath to come. Lost friend, you're facing the wrath of God. Judgment's coming. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will stand before the living God. And it's a fearful thing. The Bible says to stand before the living God. All preachers are trying to scare us. Well, if you're lost, you ought to be. You're in danger of dying and going to hell. We want to warn you. Flee the wrath to come. Embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Here in John 12, some denounced those who were praising Jesus when he came in. Jesus said, you know, if these people held their peace, the very rocks would cry out. You ever, what, what would the rocks say? If the rocks could testify... Well, they'd probably tell of their creator, the one who made the rocks. They might talk about Jesus bringing water out of a rock. They could testify of those two tables of stone in which was written the Ten Commandments. They could talk about David's stone that slew Goliath, the cornerstone of the temple, right? About the stones used to build altars to worship God in the Old Testament. And later about that stone that was rolled away from the tomb of Christ. Hey, the rocks can testify, can't they? There's a lot that the rocks could tell us. 
Is Jesus Christ your king today? Now, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, Jesus is still the king of kings and lord of lords. You may reject him as your personal king, but he's still king. And our prayer is that you will make him your king and savior today. As we prepare for an invitation, Brother Sam, let me share, let me close with a story. Years ago, a woman was in her backyard hanging out laundry. She heard a neighbor yelling that her house was on fire. She turned and saw that her house was engulfed in flames. She ran into the house to rescue her baby girl who was asleep in a crib. In rescuing the baby, the mother was burned badly. Her face, her hands, uh, much of her body was horribly burned by the fire. But she rescued her baby who had no lingering effects. But for the rest of her life, this woman bore the scars of the burning on her face and hands. She never told her girl what had happened to her. She was afraid if she told her about the fire and going in to rescue her, she was afraid maybe the girl would feel some kind of guilt or responsibility for what had happened to her mother. So she just kind of kept that from her, didn't tell her. The girl just knew she was burned in a fire. It was senior day at school. The daughter was now a high school senior. All the parents were present. This girl was talking with a classmate when her mother walked by. The classmate said, who is that hideous woman? The girl bowed her head and said, I don't know. I don't know. She is ashamed to acknowledge her mother. A friend of the mother heard this. She took the girl aside and told her how her mother received those horrible scars, saving her from a fiery death. The girl was smitten with remorse. She went to her mother and cradled her face in her hands and kissed her over and over again and said, Mother, can you ever forgive me? I tell that story because I want us to think about this. How can we ever be ashamed to identify with Jesus Christ? He bore that crown of thorns. He suffered that agony on the cross for us and folks he did it to save us from a fiery eternal hell one day we're going to see those scars I want to bow down and kiss those nail scarred feet I want to kiss those nail scarred hands and thank him for saving me, for dying on the cross, dying a horrible death, that I might escape the fires of eternal torment. How about you?